Let me begin by thanking each and every one of you for your work to make this nation a fair, safe, inclusive, and just society. This is not easy work, it never has been, but the last few years have felt particularly hard. So my heart is with you and so is my gratitude. I know or know of many of the speakers you will hear from today and they are as thoughtful as they are passionate about their causes. So I am looking forward to hearing from them as well. Also, a special thanks to the staff at the Immigrant Learning Center for putting today's event together. There has never been a more critical time for your public programs, which allow us to stay connected and also give us the space to begin to reimagine our world and our work ahead. The topic of today's conference is uniting immigration with other social causes. I love this topic because I think it speaks directly to the moment that we're in. It is true. There really is no social issue that doesn't intersect with immigration. And many among us work across issue areas to ensure that immigrants and refugees are protected and included when other issues are being debated and problems being solved. Today, you should explore whether working on immigration in a silo is really the best way forward and what it might look like if you were more intersectional in your work. Also consider how having more partnerships and tackling the issue of immigrant justice from a, from a variety of angles could advance your work more rapidly. The speakers that follow me will walk you through what that could look like. And in my time with you, I'm gonna share why I believe we have to bring a much wider lens to our work if we are to succeed, and why the old ways of doing things simply won't serve us in the new world we're entering. I can't predict what the rest of 2020, 2021, or even 2025 is going to look like, but I think we all feel deep in our bones that things will never be the same. Arundhati Roy wrote in the Financial Times recently that historically pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. I agree. We are in the midst of a deeply transformational moment. At the same time, we're facing an alarming number of new and growing existential threats. We have a public health crisis unlike any we've seen in our lives. And instead of calling on all people of this nation to unify and care for one another, some of those in power are using this crisis to divide us in an effort to consolidate their power and authority. What we are now facing is a serious threat to our democracy and our collective future. How we move our movements, our work, and our very lives forward will require some serious work to reimagine, rethink, restructure and realign our strategies and our partnerships. And we have to begin right now. Every issue is at stake and it feels like everything we care about is under attack. This pandemic and the growing economic crisis are bearing down on us in ways we don't even realize yet. And it could get much worse. We have to ask ourselves several key questions and prepare for what could be our new reality. What if this administration gets four more years and what if they don't open immigration back up and strict restrictions become the norm? How do we shape our work? What if the election is contested and we're thrown into a constitutional crisis and election violence erupts? How would we react? What if a new administration comes in and is so overwhelmed by a pandemic and a weak economy that all other pressing issues are pushed aside? How do we move our cause forward? What if the economy forces nonprofits, academic institutions, and local governments to contract at the very moment our work is so critical? What if the pandemic persists and we continue at depression era unemployment levels for an extended period of time? What happens to the country? We know when people do not have their basic social, emotional, and economic needs met, they suffer, and they can become susceptible to divisive and potentially dangerous forces and messages. These are scary, taunting questions to ask, but given what is at stake, we can't afford not to. Human despair, disconnection, and radicalization are now our problems too. Last year in El Paso, 23 people were murdered because the shooter decided he wanted to kill Mexicans. In Texas, in March, three members of an Asian American family were stabbed in a supermarket because the perpetrator wanted to prevent spread of the coronavirus. Over the past several years, synagogues and mosques have been attacked while people were engaged in the most solemn of activities. 
These are the reminders that identity-based violence, political polarization, and social and economic deprivation are part of our reality and cannot be left unaddressed if we are to move our work forward. For years, we have argued that immigrants are an integral part of American society, which is true. But this means that we cannot ignore the changes and problems that exist within that same society in which they live. I believe we now have no choice but to engage on many more issues than we ever had to before. But don't worry, we don't have to do it alone. Think about this. The food banks and food programs that are feeding families right now across this country are also feeding immigrant and refugee family, families. The YMCAs that are providing emergency childcare right now are also serving newcomers. The medical providers who are risking their lives to test and treat the sick are treating people regardless of where they were born. These helpers aren't triaging based on immigration status. They're just fulfilling their missions to help everyone in society. The groups that provide job training and upskilling in order to pull people out of the poverty and despair that can lead to radicalization are helping us too. The groups providing addiction recovery services and mental health counseling for families who need hope and a way forward are helping us too. We have all these partners helping us. Are we helping them? What if we partnered with a, with a broader swath of nonprofits, researchers, and service providers who are doing the work to solve so many of the problems of society that are getting in our way and making our jobs harder? I know this might feel like I'm asking you to work double overtime at a time when you're already stretched thin and couldn't even begin to think about how to align yourself with new movements, causes, and organizations, and even entirely new approaches to your work. You have enough to do and a cause to fight for already. But what I'm proposing is that you make new friends and new allies so that you can get to the finish line quicker. In fact, we created the Center for Inclusion and Belonging at the American Immigration Council to commit ourselves and to the world that we would advance new strategies and partnerships unlike any we forged in the past. We know there are simply not enough of us to get to justice. We need more partners outside of our traditional ones. A more diverse pool of thinkers and doers is a good thing. Several sets of extra hands are always a blessing. And the bottom line is, we can't solve the immigration issue in a silo because it doesn't exist in a silo. I also believe we need to add to our list of partners, those groups challenging political division and polarization, as well as those groups defending democracy and working to prevent political and identity-based violence. Without this kind of work, hate crimes become increasingly normalized. The poison of political division continues to infect our country and authoritarianism continues to rise. So we need to be partners in this work and rethink what our own roles are in the politics of division. And now is the time. This pandemic can be our powerful reset moment. We have before us this incredibly scary but unique opportunity. We are a nation united to defeat this pandemic. Despite what some of our leaders are saying, I see people helping, caring, sharing, and connecting to one another. We must lift up this renewal of unity, this growing mutual care, and our shared responsibility to build our nation together. The administration is afraid of our unity. They are desperately trying to get us back into our opposite corners. We must resist taking the bait and jumping back into division politics. I know that's tough but I believe it's key to our long-term success. To quote my colleague, Suzette Brooks Masters, immigration is a prime wedge issue being used to tear Americans apart. The way supporters of immigrants and immigration play defense and offense in this moment must not exacerbate polarization since that weakens our democracy, causes alienation and distrust of our institutions and plays to the strengths of demagogues and nationalists. We must stick to unity messaging and activities, otherwise we are literally helping our opposition. Wonderful lessons from social psychology teach us that the goal of defeating a common enemy is so powerful an organizing force that it can bring together individuals from groups, factions, and coalitions that are usually estranged or even in conflict. In other words, COVID can be the cause that brings us together across differences 
the cooperation and care we are showing one another is allowing us to redraw our in-group and our out-group boundaries. We can redefine those in-groups and our partnerships and alliances as we make curing the disease and caring for one another the common cause. I really urge you to think on this. We may never get a reset moment like this again in our lifetimes. It truly is the right moment to reimagine, rethink, restructure, and realign our strategies and our partnerships as we move into the new world. Imagine a future where feeding programs, community and youth serving organizations, job programs, democracy builders, and others are part of our inner circle. I believe this diversity of thought and experience will lead to better outcomes on our issue. We simply can't cure all of society's ills without a much bigger table of partners. And so many of society's ills are getting in the way of immigrant justice. Imagine in five or 10 years, looking back at this moment as a gift and a moment of rebirth. I wanna look back on 2020 as the transformational moment in our history that resulted in a new enduring story of a country and a world that became more interconnected and more caring and also the moment when we, when we became a more diverse, more inclusive, and more effective social justice movement. I invite you all to learn today from the fabulous speakers that follow about the important social causes that we need to better connect across. And then I invite you to keep adding names to that list. We need each other, and we need each other right now. I hope we can cross the portal this pandemic has opened up for us with a renewed sense of connection, appreciation for our shared destiny, and knowledge of what's possible when we look out for one another and align our work with more partners than we ever thought possible. I believe in you. You can get through this. We're gonna get through this together. We're gonna be better and stronger on the other side. I have no doubt. I hope you'll be in touch and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wendy. And maybe I could have a little bit of a discussion with you. Absolutely. Um, one of the things that stood out to me, uh, to us, and part of the reason we wanted to do this conference was the criticism that the immigrant integration field was, had deepened its support, but not broadened its support. Do you agree with that? That sounds right. I mean, I, you know, as I'm giving the comments and I'm also seeing who's on the line, I'm, I'm inspired because I know that a lot of people are already working intersectionally. And so it's not that a lot of people aren't. I think there's some people that have gone deep and not wide, but there's certainly people who have gone wide, wider. And I think what I'm trying to argue is go even wider, right? There's even more people who want, want to align with us, who want to help with that, who want to help us and who care. And so just keep our eyes open for that. And hopefully it will make our jobs easier because we'll have more people at the table with us. And what kind of work is your center uh, working on right now? And I know it's, it's, it's not based on the election. They say it's, it's a long-term strategy. What have you found in some of the research that you've done so far? Um, you know what we found, Enzel, is we're really trying to build just a bigger table of problem solvers. And we found that there's so many people in society that want to help, right? People we haven't always traditionally thought of. So libraries, museums, um, feeding programs, rotary clubs. There are people who want to help, who are engaged, who see that there's a need. They don't self-identify as immigrant rights groups or um, immigrant rights service providers, but they do because they provide for everybody in society. So we're finding a lot of willingness to come to the table and problem solve, um, to figure out how to build more sort of belonging and inclusion in communities. Um, and that's very exciting. And we're also learning, quite frankly, through a lot of our research that different people need different messengers and different people need to be connected to in community through different um, kinds of organizations, right? Everybody's, not everyone is ready to start work with the refugee resettlement group, but they might be willing to do a community-based project at a Y where they might get to know newcomers, right? So I think it's a matter of us really diversifying the table so that there's different messengers different role models and different community leaders that can connect to people and help bring them along on the issue of, uh, of immigration and refugees. When we think of our audiences, as you say, we need to tailor messages. Not everyone, it's not a one size fits all at all. Um, and we have Mohammed Naeem, who's gonna join us a little bit later on, who used to work with More In Common and now works with you. 
And I remember more in Common's research found that the wings, or the two extremes of the right and the left, were actually getting bigger, not smaller. And the people who were in the middle, uh, moderates, that that population was actually shrinking. Have you also seen this? So I think I think there's a lot of similarity before, between what we found in some of our research and more in common did that there truly are wings on the on the issue, but there is a lot of people in the middle who don't like to get involved in the politics of immigration and they're a little turned off, honestly, because they don't like may not like politics or they may not like issues where that get really heated. And so what are other ways we can, you know, bring people to help us without asking them to to, to make a choice, right? We're not asking them to pick a side. We're saying, hey, do some cool project in your community that serves everyone in the community, including your new neighbors from, you know, you name the place. And so it's like just giving people like a safe way in at the beginning, I think is really important. Um, and then hopefully over time, they'll get more committed to the cause as much as we are and wake up everyone every day and want to solve the problem. But um, I guess what I'm mostly worried about is people have a lot of problems right now and it's getting kind of worse, right? And so how can we invite them to be part of the solution on our issue um, in a way that they can solve maybe some of their own problems? And so, I mean, we're all still figuring it out, but our jobs have gotten a little bit harder. And so we just have to be a heck of a lot more creative um, in how we bring people towards us rather than push people away from us because they go, oh, I don't want to hang out with those people who have taken that side or that side. We're, we're just talking about human services and serving people and giving them their dignity and their best shot at a good life. And I think that resonates with a lot of people who would otherwise say, I don't want to choose side on a hot political debate. So two things come to mind. One, if we want to be able to reach out to all these people, now is the time to get allies in diverse groups so we can understand those audiences, right? And the second thing is, if you want to elicit that kind of reaction, I'm reminded of, I think it's Dr. Justin Guest from George Mason, who said that anti-immigrant sentiment is much more passionate than pro-immigrant sentiment. And that's a huge thing to defeat. What, what do you have to say or what reassurance or, or uplifting message do you have to sort of counter that? Well, uh, I'm a big fan of Justin Guest, so I'm not going to counter it. I, I'm going to actually agree that um, a lot of the public is more susceptible to anti-immigrant messaging than we'd like, and particularly in times where they feel under economic threat or under other threats like disease. And so we are in potentially a, a more difficult environment if people are continually feeling somehow immigration presents a threat to their well-being. So we do have to be really, really smart about addressing those underlying concerns and working through those um, rather than um, pushing hard on the political side of this, like kind of like you have to take a guess, you have to make a decision. So look, I do think it's a small wing of people who wake up every day and say, I want to fix immigration and make this country more diverse and welcoming and supportive to newcomers. And then I think there's a small wing over here that wakes up every day and wants to solve immigration, but they just have very different ideas of how to do that than we do. But I really think there's a lot of people in the center that are up for grabs, so to speak. And if we're not really strategic about grabbing them and pulling them towards us. As I said, I think there's some really evil forces that want to pull them and they have at their advantage the fact that um, there's a, a, a powerful economic threat happening right now where a lot of people are experiencing that and they might decide that immigration is part of the problem. So we have a lot of work to do to make sure we're really thoughtful about that. So I think Justin's points are really important because it's a it's an important warning to us that we can't take anything for granted and we have to do really important work where we reach people where they're at figure out their fears and concerns and help address them and move them closer to us otherwise we literally seed them to kind of scary opposition forces and let's remember that not to the, the onus is on us we are up against a lot of very uh, you know, a lot of little sound bites that sound that can really convince people that immigrants take jobs, they've been crime, they've been disease, and we've been hearing those messages for our entire lives. It's a lot of um, for us to counter, and I think when we have more diverse allies, we have a stronger case. We were able to counter those things a lot more effectively, right? Yeah, I think so. I think we have to get really, really strategic in the years ahead. 
And I think as you partner with people who do work in communities and in different parts of the country, you'll see how they talk about immigration and newcomers and integration and rights and everything else in a, in a localized way that makes sense for them locally. So I just, I always advise people to like come up with your messages locally and strategies locally because that's where the brilliance is, right? At the most local level and actually national leaders, we need to learn from what's happening locally um, rather than vice versa. Tell us how to talk about immigration at a national level so it will resonate um, in your community um, and, with, and with your constituents. And before I let you go, I want, maybe you can give us, what is your one top tip for everyone today? The one thing you want them to walk away with or the one thing, one bit of advice you think they should be including in their work? I think my, you know, big thing right now is like, it's hard to do, but spend a little time, carve out a little time and just question everything you're doing. Just, just if it's just an exercise, question your assumptions, question your tactics, question your strategies. Even if you go back to them, just look at everything, you know, with a critical eye, knowing the uncertainty we, we are in, the uncertainty we're walking into, like question your assumptions and talk to other people and see if there aren't some tweaks you should make to your, to your work to make it more impactful, more intersectional, and hopefully um, move us quicker towards where we're trying to get. 